Shoreline Community Church does so much. And the truth of the matter is that none of that could happen if it weren't for the volunteers that make each ministry happen. Many of these people are behind the scenes. Many of them are not recognized. Many of them, you wouldn't know if they walked up to you. I would really like to participate in what's going on in church, but I feel like my personality doesn't allow me to do that. And so by staying back in the shadows, I'm really helping bring the message of the Lord out to the people without necessarily having to be at the forefront of what everybody thinks is happening. And I like working with cameras. It's a, it's a passion of mine, so that's why I serve with the production um, crew. The reason that I serve is really just because I just felt led by uh, God to be in this space. Um, it's important to be His hands and His feet. It's important to be part of the community of the church, uh, have that family so that you feel you belong. And it is an amazing thing. The reason I serve is because God has done so much for me. I wanted to do something to give back. I really enjoy serving behind the scenes because I really don't like to be out, you know, getting a lot of attention. And um, it's just a way for me to be involved, but um, to not be out there. I, I know how warm and welcoming, how nice it is to get to church and everyone's warm and welcoming, and I want to be a part of that. And it's because of these people and people like you that we are able to have this impact in our community and around the world. This is the church at work here at Shoreline and all around the world. It's people who say, how has God made me? How can I serve? What can I do? And then they contribute, and in many cases, not noticed. In some cases, they don't want to be noticed. In some cases, it's just the place that they are isn't one that gets acknowledged. And maybe on that screen, you saw some of the different, you said, I didn't know people were doing that. I didn't know we had that. I didn't know that was going on. But there's people, there's hundreds of people around this campus on a weekend serving, giving thousands of hours of all combined for the glory of Jesus and for the blessing of God's people. Although it's interesting, we're in this series called Metrics that me uh, Measurements That Matter, these metrics. So how do I know if I'm growing spiritually? And it's a great question. The question is, how do I know if I've come to the cross, I've received Jesus Christ, how do I know I'm actually you know, growing up in the maturity as a Christian? And what I noticed as I, was, as I was preparing for this message was that the first three markers, or the first three measurements are kind of more appealing than the fourth one. I mean, the first one we talked about a few weeks back was character like Jesus. I become, my character's more like Jesus. I have self-control and joy and love. It's like, well, who doesn't want that? And that's one, okay, I want to grow in that one. That makes sense. And then we talked a couple weeks ago about growing in, in knowing and following God's word. And it's amazing. I think most people actually want to know what's in the Bible. There was a study done that actually where they studied people's bucket lists. People say, what do I want to do? What's on my bucket list? That's the list of things I want to do before I kick the bucket, you know, before I die. And one of the things that was pretty common across that between Christians and non-Christians was actually to read the whole Bible. A lot of non-Christians say, I'd like to read the Bible. I'd like to know what's in that book. It's the most top-selling book in the history of the world. Why not? So that, that one's kind of like, well, that marker, yeah, I'd like to know the Bible better. And that's great. Then the next marker we talked about last week, worship. And prayer, connecting, communing with God. And what's, what Christian wouldn't say, man, I want to communicate with God. I want to feel God's leading and his power in my life. Of course. Then we get to the fourth marker of spiritual maturity. Humbly serving. It's like, yeah. What's the fifth one? Um, can, I, can, we, can we move on? You know, we live in a culture. We live in a culture that's all about, I want to get to the point in my life where other people serve me. I want to have enough money, have enough kind of, kind of clout where people serve me. And that's what life's about. You work up to a point so you don't have to serve people, right? Well, not, not in the eyes of Jesus. And, and so this marker of spiritual growth may be one of the tougher ones because it's not something we naturally want to do, but it is something that God calls us to and that God models for us. In the days of Jesus... Before he went to the cross, before Jesus died to, to bear our sins and pay the price for us, he gathered with his followers in this upper room. It's when he actually, when they celebrated communion, where he broke the bread and said, this is my body broken for you. When he poured out the cup and said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Right at that table where Jesus was going to bring communion for the first time and share it with his disciples, 
There they all sat around the table, and all of them had dirty feet. They were wearing sandals. They walked the dusty roads. Their feet were dirty. We say, well, why is that a big deal? Because in the world at that time, most households had a, a person whose job was to wash feet, among lots of other kind of household tasks. And that person, uh, and we look at well, washing feet, that's creepy and weird. Well, no, it's not. In that time of you know, the world, that was a common thing. It'd be like somebody c- coming to someone's house on a rainy day and you have a coat. And they say, oh, can I take your coat? And they shake off the water and they go hang it up somewhere or put it somewhere and bring your, it's like you're taking a coat. That's just normal courtesy. Well, that's what washing feet was like. And if there was nobody in the home to wash feet, it was not uncommon that one of the guests who came would actually say, oh, I'll just go ahead and take that task because by the door there would be a bowl, there'd be a towel, and there'd be a pitcher of water. And sometimes one of the guests would just say, oh, I'll, I'll wash feet. I'm the first one. Just like if you got someone's house, oh, I can take your coat for you. It's not my house, but I can help out. Just common courtesy. But here they are. They're all around the table, and all their feet are dirty. And Jesus looks around the table and realizes this. So Jesus gets up from the table, he goes over to where the bowl and the towel and the pitcher are. And he starts to pour the water. You know the disciples are watching him. <laughs> They're thinking, we missed it. <laughs> Jesus has been teaching us about serving. He's been caring for the broken, the oppressed, the poor. He's been serving us and serves everybody. And we all walked right by the opportunity. So Jesus pours the water. And one by one, he walks around the table. And he begins to wash their feet. Now, Here's the reality. You can't wash feet standing up. You have to kneel. Get this picture in your mind. Jesus Christ, God, Emmanuel, in human form, kneels down at the feet of Thomas, who's gonna doubt him, and he washes his feet. Jesus kneels at the feet of Judas, who's gonna betray him. And the Lord of glory, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, washes Judas' feet. He gets to Peter, who's going to deny him three times. And Jesus knows that. And he washes his feet. Peter actually has a conversation with Jesus about that and ends up saying, okay, you can wash my feet. But, but it, it, you know, Jesus, one by one, washes their feet. And then he gets up, and he actually wrapped a towel around his waist like a servant to, to make the picture clear. So he, so he gets up, and he comes back to the table. And look at verse 12 of John 13. When he had finished washing their feet, Jesus put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is the messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Boy, Jesus looks at his followers, and I believe he speaks the same message to us today. He says, if you come to the cross, if you receive the grace of Jesus, this message is for you. Jesus says, I've washed your feet. I've gone to the cross and paid the ultimate humble sacrifice for you. And I call you, if you're my follower, to follow me into a lifetime of humbly serving others. Now, I want to think about that together. I want to dig into into God's word together. And and I know for some, I've I've heard that for some of you, some of you are note takers and you love to write down each point. And so here's what I want to tell you. Don't worry about notes today. Some of you have been like feverishly trying to take every note of what I share. All of the notes are right now, they're on the website. If you go to the daily reading guide and you click on today's sermon notes, it'll open up and everything that's on the screen is there for you. So don't try to write all these things down. Just listen. And maybe write down this, what God says to your heart. You can get all the other stuff later online, okay? But just write down what God calls you to do, where he calls you to take some action in growing in service. I want to think about the why. Why would you want to grow in humble service? And it's a good question because most of us would say, honestly, left to my own devices, I don't want to grow in humble service. I I would like to grow in other people humbly serving me. Thank you very much. At least that's the way we live our lives. Why why would we want to grow in humble service? Well, here's one reason. It makes the world a better place. Imagine a world where every single person who woke up every morning said, who can I serve and how can I serve someone else? In one day, it would change the face of our world. Well, we can't control that, but we can decide we're going to live that way And if all Christians lived that way, it would bring an incredible message to the world. Why? Because it shows the presence in the heart of Jesus. 
You wanna show the presence and the heart of Jesus in our world, humbly serve somebody. I saw Jesus for the first time when a guy named Doug, a college student when I was a high school kid, offered to drive me around and take me around in his car and he humbly served me. And I saw Jesus, before I ever met Jesus, I saw Jesus because I saw Doug. And he lived as a humble servant. I thought it was strange and bizarre that he would serve me that way. But to this day, 40 years later, I've been profoundly impacted by the fact that I saw the presence of Jesus in a person who humbly served me as a kid, who was not thankful and did not deserve it and did not appreciate it, but he kept on serving. Why? Because it's the call of Jesus to serve as he has served us. After Jesus washed their feet, he said, I'm calling you to do what I've done for you. This is the call of Jesus, our Savior. Why? Because it creates a culture that is sustainable and better for everyone. If you want to change the culture of our world, start to humbly serve. I don't know if you've noticed it, but in many ways, our culture is crumbling. In many ways, our culture is changing. And when people want to be culture changers, they tend to yell and scream and complain about what's wrong in the world, which fixes precisely nothing. If you want to change the world, wash people's feet in your home, in your neighborhood, at your school, at your workplace. You want to change the world, do something. Talk is cheap. Action transforms. Before Jesus said a word to the disciples, he went one by one and washed their feet. We can change our culture and our world if we take this kind of an attitude. Why would we do this? We are all where we are because others lifted us on their shoulders, served us, and put themselves second. We would not be where we are today if somebody hadn't fed us a bottle when we were a baby, changed our diapers when we were a baby. I mean, you say, well, nobody's served me lately. I'm telling you, if you do a survey of your life, you could do a highlight reel of how people have served you, you'd be amazed at how many people put themselves second to put you first at some time in your life. And that's helped bring you where you are. Let's be those kind of people for others. Why? Because we just might discover one of the reasons God placed us on this planet. When you start humbly serving, and when you discover your spiritual gifts, that's the unique gifting that God has given you. We have a class today at one o'clock, a spiritual gifts class, where you can take a class, do a test to find out your gifts, and you can meet with a pastor or a leader and talk through how you can find a natural place of serving. It'll change your life. When I was 15 years old, and I found out that I had gifts to teach, even though I was a brand new Christian and just, was just gonna know the Bible, I had somebody start helping me begin teaching at 15, 16 years old. And I discovered, and I, and I didn't get paid to be a pastor. I didn't, I didn't, I mean, it was a volunteer for like the next five, six, seven years. But I discovered why I'm on this planet just by humbly serving, taking hours studying my Bible, preparing to teach high school kids. And I was still in high school. But I found out why I'm on this planet because using your gifts and humbly serving shows you what God has put you here for. Listen to these words from Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, we read this, beginning in verse 42. Jesus called them, his disciples, together, and he said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, all the nations of people, lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. This is followers of Jesus. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first must be slave of all. That word slave, that word doulos, is, is this humble place of serving. You must be a servant, a slave of all. For even, now listen to this, even the son of man, whenever Jesus says son of man, he's talking about himself. That was his own self-designation. Jesus said, for even the son of man, pointing to himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus said, this is what I came for not for you all to serve me. I came to serve you. And that's what he calls us to. So the what? What are ways we can measure if we're growing, uh, our, if, if we are growing hearts and lives that reflect the humble service of our Savior? How, how do I look at myself and say, well, how am I doing? Am I actually taking steps forward and growing in humble service? Here's the what. The condition of my heart, that I care about others, that I have compassion. How do I know I'm growing in humble service? Watch this now. I start to actually, brace yourselves, feel something. I see a need. And I don't just go, your problem, your problem, your problem, your problem, my life. But something happens inside of me and I see and I feel compassion. And I say, I want to serve. That's how I know I'm starting to grow 
in humble service. The what. We find ourselves serving naturally and not under a compulsion. You know you're growing as a Christian when you find yourself serving and going, I, I, I want to do this. I desire to do this. Now, I'll be honest with you. When you first start serving, oftentimes it doesn't come naturally. So here's my advice. Don't ever serve anyone unless it comes naturally. No! Thank you for not saying amen to that, anybody. Um, no! It's, it's like this, like this, it's like this. I'll diet when I feel like it. How's that going to work out for you? It's not. I'll work out when I'm so excited. Nothing in life. I'll care for my husband or wife when I feel like it. We make decisions all the time. And so I, I do want to say this. I want to say make decisions, learn to serve, seek humility, and it may be work initially. But you know you're growing in faith when it starts to become more and more natural to who you are. The what? Our acts of selfless service feel like they are part of our normal day. You know you're growing in faith and you're growing in Jesus when you just say, boy, serving people just feels like what I do. The what? People often ask for help because they know we find delight in serving others. When you're really growing in spiritual maturity and you're humbly serving, here's what happens. There'll be people that will come to you and say, hey, could you help out with this? Could you support in this? Could you get engaged in this? Because they know you're the kind of person who loves to do that. Now, that doesn't mean you have to always say yes. You still have to have boundaries and wisdom. But people start to notice, oh, you're the kind of woman, you're the kind of man who loves to serve. So people will ask you to be engaged in things. And then you can see, boy, I, I, I hear people asking me, which means I'm starting to grow. They're seeing that in me. The what? We see kingdom fruit growing because of our lives. God is touching people through us. Oh, this is glorious. You start growing in faith. You start humbly serving. And you actually see God use you to draw someone else closer to Jesus, to touch another person's life. And that's amazing. I know a lot of people on our worship team, and I asked this morning as we were praying before the service, before the, not this service, before the service, before this, the, our worship team is here for all three services. I said to them, when do you set your alarm on Sunday morning so you can come and serve at Shoreline? Five o'clock, five o'clock, five. The, the common time was five o'clock. Most of them will be here till after one o'clock today. And except for two of the people up here, they're all volunteers. They'll also practice for a few hours at home. But if I ask them why, one of the things they say is, they say, when I look out, and see people at Shoreline growing as worshipers. I just feel like I get to be part of that. Thank you, Jesus. God's using me. When somebody works with our children or our youth in our ministries here, and they see a young person grow in their faith, they go, that's, yeah, that's what I want to see. I want to see God use me to help other people grow in faith. That's true for any kind of service. The what we become aware of the needs around us and discover that there are times we care about others. Prepare yourselves for this. More than we care about ourselves. You start walking down this road and you're gonna find yourself, and something happens and you're going, well, I, I'd rather do this and I'd kind of like that, but I'm gonna take what I wanna do and I'm gonna put it aside to serve this person. You're gonna go, whoa, only Jesus. I mean, only Jesus can begin to change us like that. So, so, so there's, there's things we can kind of look at and see. Am I heading down that road? Am I growing? I love in 1 Peter chapter 4. Remember this is this call to us as we're developing our gifts and using them for the Lord. Where he writes, Peter writes, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Each of you should use whatever gift you received to serve others. That's about spiritual gifts. Use whatever gift God has given you. When you become a Christian, he gives you a gift to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, listen to this, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised. You know what gets the most glory when you serve humbly? God gets the glory. He's praised. He's lifted up through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And then in Colossians 3, we read this. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Listen to this. As working for the Lord. When you humbly serve whoever it is, whether it's a mom or a dad changing the thousandth, thousandth diaper, you know, whether, whether it's in the workplace where you're humbly serving in some way and going above and beyond, whatever it is, wherever it is, ultimately it's for the Lord. It's for God. With all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. 
It is the Lord Christ you are serving. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. You hear that? When you humbly serve, at the end of the day, it's always an act of serving Jesus, no matter who that person is. So the where and the when. What does this start to look like? How does it unfold? Ways that you and I can take steps forward into a lifestyle of service that looks like Jesus and shows his presence to the world. Just some ideas. We can engage in some kind of ministry or service in the body of Christ. This is powerful and transformative power. I want to challenge you to find a place to serve Jesus in the life of Shoreline, whether it's once a week or once a month. But there's something about serving in your church that makes the body of Christ healthy and strong. I want to challenge you, if you call this your church home, pray about that. Again, one o'clock today, there's a spiritual gifts class. You can jump in. We're going to be offering that regularly at different times. And so just listen, if you've never gone through that class, jump in sometime. Or go by the Connection Center and just say, how do I find out more about finding a place to serve at Shoreline Church? The where and the when. We plan and schedule space for service, not just once a year or every couple of years, but on a regular basis. We look at our schedule and we say, am I making time regularly to serve? It's not like, well, I went on a mission trip three years ago and I'm gonna do another one in two years and for the next these five years, I'm just not gonna serve. No, make it part of the rhythm of your life. The where and the when. We celebrate and recognize the faithful service of others. Boy, I would challenge you to thank people for their service in the church and outside of the church. But let me talk about the church for a minute. You know we have people that show up here at about the same time the worship team comes about, about you know, 6 in the morning, 6.30 in the morning to cut bagels and donuts and fruit and get it all ready for you. They put on their sanitary gloves, they get out their stuff, they clean everything, and they prepare stuff for you. Imagine a person who gets here at like 6 in the morning and they've spent three or four hours just preparing food to serve you and somebody comes and complains because they can't get the donut they like. It's like, Really? But, but these people know that they're not ultimately serving you, they're serving Jesus, so they keep serving even if somebody whines at them about their donut. It's free, right? <laughs> it's like, what? But this happens. And I, I just want to challenge you, go to those people. You know, next time you get your donut, your coffee, just pop your head in that kitchen there and say, hey, all of you that are serving, you know, whatever you got, thank you so much. Our people that are on the, doing parking and ushers and our greeters, thank you for serving us. Thank you for, for doing that. Our, our worship team, identify someone on the team and just catch them and say, thank you. You know, we, we have people that come to Monterey and leave, so you'll come and go so quickly. And a while back, this the, Kaziah, who's playing the keyboard today, she played for the first time, you know, just probably five, six months ago. And when I, I hadn't met her before, and I said, boy, that's so exciting, the new keyboard. She just volunteers, comes and serves. And I, I kind of look at her, and she's so gifted, and I thought, you know, before you know it, she's going to be gone. And so I said, I said to the worship leaders, I said, so Kaziah, where is she at school right now? Because people come for college, and they serve. So they said, well, they said, she's a sophomore. I said, oh, okay, you know, maybe we get another year or two of her being here. They said, in high school. I'm like, wow, she's really talented. But here, this high school kid, I mean, he's getting up early to come here to serve you and help lead you into the presence of Jesus. Thank you. Write a note. Come by and just catch him and say, I'm hugging you. Come here. No. Well, I can't, we, can't hug, we can't hug anymore. I'm sorry. I'm shaking your hand from a distance. There you go. But, but just say thank you. Say thank you. Celebrate and recognize faithful service. We're serious. We are serious about discovering, developing, and deploying our spiritual gifts. When we're growing in this, we get serious saying, I'm going to discover my gift. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to begin to develop it and use it for Jesus. We make a conscious decision to serve the people in our home consistently and joyfully. Of all the places that I think it's the most challenging to be a servant, it's in our home. But I want to challenge you, if you're a follower of Jesus, and, and because he's given his life for you and he's served you, in your home, commit yourself to find ways to serve consistently and regularly and lovingly and humbly. So the how. What are some practical ways we can take a next step in the spiritual maturity through serving for Jesus and serving like Jesus? Just, just make some mental notes. This. And again, this is all on the website. You can download it to kind of think it through. Making specific acts of service part of your normal week at Shoreline Church, find a weekly rhythm that there's some way I'm serving and make that part of your lifestyle. Making acts of service part of who you are at home and asking others what they don't like doing or how can I serve you. Oh, here's the problem. If you ask them, they'll tell you. If they say, why are you asking? Well, because I'm gonna start doing that for you. Then follow through day after day after day. Surprising daily 10-minute mission trips. Can I challenge you not to wait till the next trip to Guatemala or to India to serve somebody? 
but do a five or 10 minute mission trip in your home or in your neighborhood or your workplace. Look around and say, what's something I could do that maybe nobody would notice? What's something I could do that would be shocking because nobody would do this? It's, it's like washing feet. Who would do that? But I'm, I'm a Christian. I remember as a young Christian, I've been a Christian for just a short time, and God kind of put on my heart to go and clean my sister Gretchen's room. She's the one that first brought me to church. She's the one that first reached out to me. Even though I was brutal and resistant to her, she kept loving me and praying for me and sharing with me. And so God put on my heart, just go clean her room. So I went in her room and I cleaned her room. She got home. She came to me, she said, were you in my room? And I said, yeah. She said, why? I said, I cleaned it. She says, what'd you do? <laughs> She's thinking snakes and spiders and, you know, this kind of stuff. And I said, Gretchen, I just, I just cleaned it. That's all I did. And she said, why? And for the first time in our relationship, I looked at my sister, one year older than me. And I said, Gretchen, because I love you. I never said those words before. I don't know if I'd even actually felt that way toward her up to that point in my life. I was so self-centered. But serving opens the door. Serving has an impact. Do a five or 10 minute mission trip in your home once a week and surprise somebody with service and it'll usher in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Experiment and try new ways to serve. Find a, try something new in the church. Go on a, get, jump into a new community outreach event that you've never been part of and just see what it's like to be part of the food pantry, the clothing closet, or visit a retirement center. Go serve someone in a new way. Determine what foot washing looks like in different settings God sends you and do it. Stop in your workplace and look around and say, what would it look like to wash feet here? Can I suggest that you not actually try to wash anyone's feet? Um, you get fired for that probably. But, uh, um, but just say, what, what would a humble service look like and pursue that and do it? Even if you're the boss, even if you own the business, especially if you're the boss, especially if you own the business, model the heart of Jesus. Take a spiritual gifts class. And do the gift survey. Meet with the church leader. Learn how God's gifted you. And then who will you become? As we mature in faith, as we grow in service, who might we become if we really live this out? You'll be seen as gracious and care, a gracious and caring person because that's who you're going to become. The more you humbly serve, the more grace pours through you. And people will say, oh, she's so gracious. He's so humble. He's such a servant. That's how people will see you. People will ask the profound theological question, Why? Why do you serve? Why do you care? Why do you keep, when nobody, people don't even appreciate you. Why? And if they ask that question, you tell them why. Because I know someone who has served me more than I could ever serve you. Who's that? His name's Jesus. And you share about the one who served you with his own life. Who you're gonna become. People will see Jesus alive in our world today through you. I saw Jesus through Doug, a college student, who drove me around in his car and humbly served me. People will see Jesus because you humbly serve them. Lives will be healed, helped, and humanized. As you serve, you will become an agent of change in the world. And, and with all people, so many people yelling and talking about how the world should change and doing nothing, be the person who does something. Be the person who takes the message and the work of Jesus and extends it through humble service. You will find joy in deep and real human connection. Boy, as you grow in humble service, as you grow in humble service, God is gonna connect you to people in a new way, in your home, in your neighborhood, in the church, in your community. When I think about Jesus at the table with his disciples, looking around and realizing that everyone's feet were dirty still, I don't think Jesus got up ticked off and, oh, I'm so, what's wrong with these people? I'm gonna show them. I don't, that was in the heart of Jesus. He looked around that table and he saw their feet still dirty. And he looked by the door and he saw the bowl and the towel and the pitcher, unused. And he just thought, okay, one more time. I mean, he's about to go to the cross. He's about to have nails driven through his wrists and his feet and bear the weight of their sin and our sin. And Jesus says, one more time. And one by one, he kneels at their feet and he washes their feet. And you think, was there, was there a moment at that table where Jesus thought, they just don't deserve it? Well, I'll tell you what, Jesus knew they didn't deserve it. He didn't serve us because we deserve it. He served it because he loves us. He, ser he served because that's what he came to do. He came to, to serve, not to be served, and to give his life as a ransom. When Jesus was carrying the beam of that cross up the hill, when they were driving nails through his hands and through his feet, 
And he's looking at the people who are mocking and jeering and spitting and making fun of him. Is there a point where Jesus would have thought they don't deserve it? He, yes, he knew they didn't and we don't deserve it. He didn't die because we deserve it. He didn't serve because we deserve it. He did it because he loves. And if you're getting weary, some of you are serving faithfully, you're getting weary in your home with your spouse, with your kids, and you're getting weary of serving, and you're thinking, you know, they just don't deserve it. You say, yeah, fair enough. But I'm called to serve like Jesus served. I'm called to usher the very kingdom of God into this world. And it comes as I wash feet. It comes as I serve in the name of Jesus. And this is revolutionary. This is home-changing, community-changing, world-changing. And this is the call of Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we pray together right now that you'll speak to our hearts. We've been so conditioned by our world to try to posture ourselves in a place where everyone serves us because we've made it, we've arrived. Or at least that's where we want to be. And yet, Jesus, you gave a different vision of life and a different vision of the world. So, Lord Jesus, right now, as we, as we sing this closing prayer, this beautiful prayer, this song that expresses our hearts, will you search our hearts? Will you speak to us about becoming humble in our service? If we're a follower of yours, Jesus, this is our call. If we're just investigating the Christian faith, may we understand that this is part of what Jesus leads people to. This is the journey. Lord, meet us in this moment of prayer and song.